So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Raymond Ha, and I'm uh, one of uh, the spine surgeons at the USC Spine Center. Um, and this is part of an ongoing series of innovations and advances in comprehensive spine care. I'm here with uh, my co-speaker, Zori Buser, who uh, is our PhD at, at the USC Spine Center and helps to run Dr. Wong's lab as well. So she'll be talking um, about um, some pretty interesting things from, uh, from uh, the, uh, the basic science side. Um, to just give you an intro, this is uh, the team. Um, we have uh, three neurosurgeons, uh, three orthopedic spine surgeons, and uh, three uh, physical medicine rehabilitation or physiatry, um, uh, two of whom recently joined us, David Chang and Gene Techmeister, and uh, Christopher Ornelas, who is our third. Um, our co-directors are John Liu and, uh, and uh, Jeffrey uh, Wong. And uh, really, our, our team has come together as a multi multidisciplinary approach. Um, we really uh, have a multidisciplinary team here uh, trying to provide solutions for really a quite uh, varied and complex clinical uh, problems which are associated with the neck and back. And so we're really working all together um, with our whole team around us uh, to really give appropriate care, um, which of course is no as surgery. It sometimes is surgery, but uh, certainly diagnosing accurately and meeting a patient's problem with the correct uh, level of care. Um, our goal is to customize everybody's treatment plan with their specific needs and their condition. We really have um, uh, a wide range of expertise in many areas, I mean, cervical, lumbar, um, minimally invasive, uh, adult spinal deformity, pedi pediatric deformity, uh, tumors, and trauma. Um, so, so the wide range of uh, spine surgery coverage. Additionally, um, uh, in, in the interventional medical spine care side, experts in uh, injection procedures and minimally invasive pain techniques, um, including uh, spinal cord stimulator, uh, uh, dorsal root ganglion stimulators, um, pain pumps when it uh, is required, um, but uh, really taking a holistic approach and specializing in the rehabilitation and uh, non-operative treatment of, uh, of spine disorders, which actually makes up the bulk of, uh, of uh, spine problems uh, that we see. Um, and of course, uh, additional diagnostics such as nerve conduction testing and uh, EMG. Um, we really are dedicated to using the most advanced technology for spine surgery um, after a diagnostic and treatment plan for patients experiencing high acuity conditions and with a high level of complexity. And this is uh, our mission statement to really be recognized worldwide um, as a leading academic spine center uh, for appropriate state-of-the-art multidisciplinary patient care, um, spine education, which I'll get a little bit into, um, and innovative spine research, which I think uh, perhaps is the, the most important. Um, we are at a, a variety of locations. Um, the primary surgeries are out of the Keck University Hospital with some of the more, uh, the less complex surgeries uh, um, being done at Verdugo Hills Hospital as well. Um, our spine center clinic locations, though, range uh, for all the way from Arcadia uh, down uh, to El Segundo and everything in between up and including uh, Ridgecrest. Um, from the educator side, uh, we have a residency both in neurosurgery and orthopedic spine surgery. We train both the residents. Uh, we have a, a spine fellowship, a surgical spine fellowship uh, with anywhere between uh, uh, three and four fellows uh, yearly, and both neurosurgeons and uh, orthopedic surgeons, as well as a medical spine fellowship uh, in which they work uh, uh, with um, our physiatrists <clears throat> to get advanced training on spine medicine and interventions, um, and also medical students, international surgeons who come to do research uh, in, in our labs and, and um, multiple PhD researchers. Um, our, our physicians are, are involved in international education. This is a picture of, uh, of uh, Dr. Shea, uh, Wang, and Liu uh, doing a, a course in China I think it was kind of one of, one of the first broadcasted cadaver labs that uh, they boast. And I, I don't remember the exact number of people who were watching broadcast, but it was something uh, like in the, in the dozens of thousands. Um, really a focus on international education and growth. 
um, with connections and uh, past training, uh, as well as connections through the Global Spine Congress um, with uh, multiple international uh, spine societies, um, and uh, really working to foster uh, USC hospital relations uh, with international surgery programs. Uh, on the research side, uh, there's a ton of research, um, tissue engineering for disc regeneration, um, anti-cancer and brain tumor research, uh, spine care clinical outcomes research, and of course, um, really rich collaborations with the School of Engineering, uh, the Stem Cell um, <clears throat> Institute, and uh, the Norris Center for Cancer Care. Uh, just a brief plug, I wanted uh, everybody to jot down the date. If we ever get out of uh, this uh, situation and can get free from uh, quarantine and sheltering in place, we'd love uh, for you guys to join us. Uh, in Hawaii, I think it'd be a good way to try to uh, cap off the quarantine and, and celebrate and learn some spine. The, the dates tentatively are June 21st to 24th, uh, barring any other uh, global disaster. So with that, uh, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Zori Buser. Thanks, Ray. Okay. Um, thanks so much. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, as Dr. Ham mentioned, research is a really an important component uh, at our spine center. And given that this is just one of the many uh, sessions that we will have uh, throughout the year, um, what, the, uh, what I was thinking would be great would be to cover and take more of a high level approach and cover the future of spine care because in the previous sessions and the upcoming sessions, we've heard about a lot of different spinal pathologies, operative, non-operative treatments, and also the outcomes. Um, as Dr. Ha mentioned, I'm one of the research faculties in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Neurosurgery here at USC. I have no conflicts for the current uh, talk. These are just my disclosures outside of this. Uh, presentation. So uh, throughout the, the 20 minutes, I'll hope to be even uh, shorter than that, what I was uh, hoping we can cover when we think about the future of spine care is really to get our uh, evidence on the current trends in spine pathologies, uh, the costs of spine care, we are all interested in that, and the value, and then really that kind of nicely transitions into the predictive analytics and AI and machine learning. And I think it will also nicely go along with Dr. Ha's presentation. So uh, the first thing to think about is we know that uh, spinal pathologies are one of the leading causes of disability worldwide. But to get the facts and the evidence, we have to look at uh, where we stand in the United States and globally. So this was one of the uh, recent studies done by the Global Burden of Disease, and they looked at both low back pain and neck pain. And what they found, I know this is a busy table, but they looked at the different age groups and then looked at the most common uh, pathologies that are leading causes of disability worldwide. And the more red, there was the higher incidence of that pathology. So what you can see is we all know that um, spine pathologies are usually associated with increasing in age. What you can see is that the incidence, and I don't know if you can see my mouse, is that the back and neck pain are also in the younger populations, uh, increasing the years lived with disability, starting from 25 to 29 and so on. And another thing to keep in mind is that we cannot just focus on back pain uh, and neck pain or spine pathologies, we always have to think about other comorbidities that come along. And obviously what we can see, and there has been a lot of research done also within our group uh, here at Keck, uh, is that the depression is definitely one that is also very prominent uh, worldwide. And we know that there is association between uh, spine pathologies and mental disorders. And what this study found is that in this uh, time frame between 1990 and 2005, uh, that there was a 34.5 increase in a low back pain and 18.6 in neck pain with the years lived with disability. This is another recent study that again looked at um, 
only focused on lumbar spine and uh, lumbar spine pathologies, and they had a little bit of a different approach. They looked again at the worldwide distribution of these pathologies, and you can see that here in the United States, we are somewhere in the middle in the annual incidence, probably around 3.5, um, 3,500 per 100,000. And they also uh, broke broke it down to the three most common pathologies. So what you can see here in the United States, in Canada, the highest uh, percentage is uh, belongs to the disc degenerative uh, disorder for, followed by spinal stenosis and spondy. So a lot of studies have looked at low back pain and usually low back pain is the main focus. Um, however, neck pain, uh, neck pain um, neck pathologies are very prevalent as well. Uh, this, um, this is another uh, epidemiological study done by the Global Burden of Disease, just got published and they looked at the incidence of neck pain globally. Um, again, for the United States, we are somewhere around 850 uh, to 900 uh, per 100,000 uh, patients. And uh, what they did further, they also stratified it by demographics. And although it's a little bit of a busy slide, uh, what you can see here, they looked at the total number of cases based on gender. And when you look at those thick lines where um, orange represents females and purplish uh, blue males, you can see that the incidence of neck pain is increasing with age and it was higher overall in females than male patients. And then when they looked at the prevalence rates per 100,000 uh, uh, adjusted for age, what they found, and which also corresponds to that low back pain slide we saw is that we are seeing more of neck pain as low, low back pain in younger populations. So already in this graph, you're seeing what we are seeing is between 40 to uh, 54, so in that 10 year increment. So these were some of the epidemiological studies and what our group has looked at, as many others, we utilized one of the commercially available uh, da national databases that feeds from different insurance providers. And what we looked in this study, we used both uh, private insurance and as well as Medicare, looked at the spinal pathologies trends uh, as well as surgical and non-surgical um, treatment, and also uh, looked at the demographics, how that changes. So what we found uh, when we looked, when we broke down by lumbar and cervical, and this is only really for lumbar patients, what you can see when we see, look at the number of patients with lumbar degeneration from 2006 through 2011, number of cases with um, new incidence of degeneration decreases. Same is happening with the number of uh, those patients who had non-operative treatment. But what we found was that there was an increase uh, in uh, a number of fusions among those patients. And other studies have found similar trends. This was another study published recently. They used uh, inpatient sample database, national uh, inpatient sample database, and then compared 2004 and 2015. And these were the rates per 100,000, as usual. And what you can see, that there is an increase, obvious increase in 2015, and that that increase is followed with age, that uh, we are seeing it in older patients. And the same holds true for the total volume, which is on this side. And you can see that there is a large increase of the total uh, spinal procedures performed in certain age, older age groups in 2015. Um, as a, along with the epidemiological data, uh, there are some very interesting studies that have been published recently utilizing MRI. And this study was published in JBJS. And what they did, they uh, started with 497 volunteers. So not patients who had spinal surgery, but just patients who had uh, some type uh, volunteers and they looked at the progression of their cervical uh, spine pathologies or degeneration in general. They started for, with 497 patients and 20 years later, um, they had around 30% follow-up rate and they took MRIs of those 193 patients and looked at different degenerative changes and then also um, looked at how those degenerative changes have impacted 
medication reported outcomes in the sense how they have impacted their pain scale and functional uh, outcomes. So what you can see on this graph, um, what they looked at, and I know it has a lot of data, they looked at the uh, DSI represents actually degeneration. Uh, then this was the anterior compression. Uh, this was disc prolapse posteriorly, disc reduction in disc height and foraminal stenosis. So, and the percentage on this, uh, on the Y scale represents the change between the baseline and 20 years later. So when you look at the different age groups starting, I believe this was 30 to 39, and then in 10 year increments, you can see that all of them are experiencing, except the latest, uh, the oldest age group, all of them are experiencing 80% more increase in degenerative changes, even at the younger age. And the similar trends for most of the groups were seen for compression and prolapse, and least was obvious that the changes were seen in disc height and foraminal stenosis. But what was very interesting was when they compared these changes to shoulder stiffness, neck pain, headache, arm pain, the only significance that they found was between the arm pain and the foraminal stenosis, so that there was an increase in the um, arm pain, uh, but they didn't find any uh, increase in the neck pain uh, with uh, the, any of those degenerative changes. And when we think of uh, cervical spine pathologies, we always think of treating neck pain. Uh, but something to think about is also the axial pain, obviously, that it's important to look at. So um, having this research is important when we start uh, planning uh, future directions and current treatments for the uh, patient care. And we've done, we are in the progress of actually um, submitting two uh, studies. We've looked at how degenerative changes, uh, what's happening in thoracic and lumbar spine. And we did a cross-sectional study of 1,000 symptomatic patients who had um, MRIs in this time period of three years. And we looked really at all set levels from C7, T1 to T12, L1. So this is just a quick, and this uh, paper is in, in journal revision. So our age groups were similar to the previous uh, study in JBJS, starting with 20 to 29 in 10-year increments, and the group five was 60 and above. And the percentage uh, here on the Y scale represents the increase in degeneration per level, all thoracic levels. And you can see, obviously, that with age, there is more degeneration and that certain levels degenerate more than the others. So um, to, when we think, so covering the incidence where we stand currently on uh, spine pathologies, it's obviously important to look at what about uh, our spendings and uh, healthcare utilization. And recently in JAMA, uh, there was a great study published looking at the healthcare spendings uh, by type of insurance and health conditions uh, for the past uh, 20 years. And uh, what they uh, did, they broke it down by different age groups, younger than 20, then 20 to 44 and in 20 year increments. And then they also had uh, public insurance, private insurance and out of pocket. So what you, as you can see, obviously musculoskeletal disorders are on the top of the list with total spending of 380.9 billion. And as the age changes, we can see that for 65 and above, it's primarily public insurance. And then for younger population, there is a lot of health insurance and this is uh, the part of the out of pocket. So when we take this musculoskeletal data and the spendings that it's spent on all uh, musculoskeletal disorders and look at low back pain and neck pain, this histogram shows how the uh, public uh, private insurance and out of pocket distribution looks like in billion um, and for female and male. And you can see that it's uh, very similar between two genders and that with obviously we are again seeing that in the age groups we start somewhere at 35 uh, up to 74 is where the most spending is uh, happening. 
And then when this is switched, then when we look at the total insurance then uh, costs that we are having in uh, comes to low back pain and neck pain, what's been spent it, it, for the public insurance, it's 45.3 billion with private insurers. It's one of the most spent conditions where the most money is uh, spent, uh, almost 77 billion. And then out of pocket is totaling to 12.4 um, billion. And um, this, is, this was uh, just one study that looked at overall uh, the most recent other studies utilizing either various databases or their own center data have also found that the increased costs of spine care and spine uh, procedures. This one looked again at spinal fusion over um, 11 years and uh, the total costs have been increasing and also the mean cost of hospital charges been increasing steadily over years. Similarly, we published recently another study looking at MIS procedures and if MIS is really more, uh, truly more. And what we found, it was a mix of a review paper and also some of the data using billing records. But what we found was that really the evidence that we have on MIS, although papers suggest that costs less, still uh, lacks in the sample size, uniformity, number of surgical levels, and what you can see when we looked at some of the billing records, and when you look at, for example, posterior one level MIS fusion, uh, the average cost was, the average reimbursement was 9,800, but then standard deviation only 2,000. So there is still a lot of work, obviously, uh, for our field to do to understand the costs and bring it closer to the evidence how we uh, want to treat. So one of the studies, uh, actually one of the approaches that been becoming more popular in the spine field, and in my opinion leads towards obviously predictive analytics, um, is uh, this utilization of time-driven activity-based costing. And Greg, Dr. Greg Schroeder and uh, co-workers did a study where they looked at at the cost, true cost of one and two level ACDFs. They uh, looked, uh, utilized seven stages of care, really from the beginning to the end, uh, 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 and uh, also two follow-ups. And they looked at the resource utilization, the cost of resources, and, ev and every single team member. And in this study, it was a prospective study. They had 27 patients with 11 having single level and two, um, uh, and 16 having two levels. These were the cost, the difference was around $3,000 between um, single and two level uh, ACDFs. And um, here is the breakdown that is general on what's spent the most. So uh, the majority of the costs for ACDFs goes on the hospital disposable costs, which is anything from um, admission to discharge, including pain medication, including spine instrumentation, as instru instrumentation cages, anything. So 50% really goes on that. And then the 20% is interop costs, followed by overhead and some other uh, minor costs. So this paints really a really nice picture for us to start understanding how the costs and where we can uh, work on uh, improving the uh, costs and reimbursements and also the vo patient volume. Another important thing, when we look at these costs, we cannot just focus on uh, the main components, but we have to look at the, each patient or groups of patients and see uh, their comorbidities. And we looked at, this was a study that we just finished and submitted to uh, JNS, and we looked at the modifiable risk factors in lumbar fusion and how they change complication rates and readmissions up to 180 days. And we found just for 30 days, we found that malnutrition, dyslipidemia, and primary hypertension were increasing chance of my MI and also acute renal failure. And these profiles we saw as well uh, at 90 and 180 days with some of the hardware failure and neurological injury. So all of this, I think, leads to predictive analytics that have been utilized in healthcare a lot and also more and more in spine and probably in, in some way it's a future of our uh, spine 
evidence and research. And what predictive analytics do, they can estimate likelihood of a certain event, for example, readmission, complication, revision, based on histor historical data. And not only that they can help us improve patient treatments and outcomes, there is also uh, a portion with administrative and financial component and also patient satisfaction. So when we look at this uh, future of spine care and how much has been done, these are just some of the examples uh, they had, have been uh, looking uh, at various outcomes using predictive analytics. And given that our group here at USC, our multidisciplinary team, as Dr. Ha me mentioned with the PT department, is focusing also on discharge and length of stay, uh, this study uh, used predictive analytics uh, to see if uh, what uh, factors can predict uh, extended length of stay and discharge to rehab institutions. And this was done for all the patients retrospectively who had uh, spine surgery between January and June 2018. And what they did first, they looked at the length of stay less than seven days and more than seven days and looked really at different variables that might have impact on the length of stay. And then once when they identified the ones that were significant, such as non-married, uh, then insurance type, surgical procedure and procedure time, they built predictive models. So what you can see here is that uh, for the prolonged length of stay surgery and also the emergent non versus non-emergent case were predictors of the extended length of the stay. And for the rehab, uh, discharge to rehab, there was the age, uh, then type of insurance, surgery again, but as well as the procedure time. So these uh, models can definitely help us with certain data that sometimes it's not even large to predict some of those um, outcomes. And that all those predictive analytics in a way feed to the next step, which is machine learning and AI. And when we think about spine, um, these are some of the definitely fields where AI and machine learning can help us. Uh, devise better treatments and improve uh, care and volume. So uh, lots of studies that have used AI and machine learning again. And what I found very interesting in all of these studies is that they use different uh, types of evidence or data sets. Some use registries, some use databases that are commercially available uh, to everyone. Some use single center studies that maybe have 30 patients and we know how much of a struggle is working with a small uh, patient population when we are trying to analyze and uh, come up uh, with guidelines and some outcomes, meaningful data. So this is just one of the uh, studies to show the example where we are heading in spine research. And this study looked at a single level uh, discectomy and uh, if machine learning can uh, predict uh, patient reported outcomes and clinically meaningful uh, improvements after a year. And what they defined as a clinically meaningful is uh, more than 30% of an improvement in PROs. So they use their own registry. And at the end, after all inclusion exclusion criteria, they ended up with 422 patients. So what you can see here, what they did, they use their machine learning pro software as well. They use statistical analysis to look at which one can predict better improvement, clinically meaningful improvement in leg, back pain and functional disability. And without going into great detail, given the time constraints, you can see the higher the percentage, the better. Uh, you can see the deep learning, machine learning program was a better predictor for many of the PROs and also had better specificity, sensitivity as well, positive and negative predictive values. And they went a step further, which I think is very interesting. They made five hypothetical patients where they changed their demographics and also uh, their pre-op uh, PROs, which was uh, very interesting because that's what we are usually dealing with patients where every patient is very different and it's hard to come up with a standardized approach. And what you can see here when they use their machine learning, they found that based on patient demographics, the machine learning uh, had a different uh, success uh, in predicting 
the um, improvements in leg pain, uh, back pain, and functional disability. And I think that can help us a lot when we are uh, thinking about standardizing approaches and uh, providing patients with evidence on how they will uh, do and feel after certain um, treatments. And last but not least, um, something that I think is very interesting, and um, especially nowadays with telemedicine, given that uh, we are doing a lot of telemedicine, is looking at, this was a study published by Scott Bowden and co-workers in JBJS, and they looked at the red flags for low back pain and that some red flags are not that red. So they retrospectively went and looked at nine, almost 10,000 patients, uh, looked at demographics and the positive responses to various red flag questions. And they looked at the four uh, red flag diagnosis, fracture, malignancy, infection, and cauda equina syndrome. And these were the frequency among those uh, patients. So they did a lot of analysis. And it, this is a super busy slide, and we'll just spend like 15 seconds look at it. And, but if we see, look just at the fracture and look at in patients who, had, who were older than 50 years of age or 70 years of age or had trauma, they, uh, this definitely was significantly uh, predicting positive, like uh, higher chance of having a fracture. And also absence of those parameters was also reducing the chance of having a fracture. But what we have to look at that here is that when uh, these negative likelihood ratios for them to really reduce the chance of having fracture with age higher than 50, 70 in trauma, they are definitely, if they are not present, they are reducing the chance, but not by much. And similar was for malignancy infection, cauda equina, again, loss of bladder control and bowel, both presence of both was definitely associated with high chance of cauda equina syndrome. But what they found was that absence of those two, which are loss of bladder control or bowel, didn't reduce the chance significantly for not having the cauda equina syndrome. Something that they found, which is often a red flag, night pain, was not associated with any of the red flags. And then they went further and did a combination of two red flag uh, positive uh, responses with fracture, malignancy, infection, and so very similar um, data on the red flags. And you can see that actually sensitivity for all of those is um, very low. So what they concluded that definitely some red flags, red flags are truly red and um, important to look at, but some have to be taken with caution and uh, dig deeper when we are thinking about the treatments. So with that being said, the future of spine research, definitely very promising. There are lots of new tools and methodologies. Uh, we still need more uh, well-designed uh, prospective studies and clinical trials, and also widespread use and collaborations and multidisciplinary uh, teams. And with that, I would like to thank you all. Thanks, Zori. Um, again, if you guys have any questions, uh, if you want to um, um, just drop them in the chat box either during any of the talks or at the end at Q&A. Um, that's always a really interesting thought. I think, um, you know, we're kind of in the era, I, I think, research-wise of, of big data and, and, and certainly other sectors like advertising have, have obviously uh, perfected this um, with, uh, you know, analytics and, and uh, tailored advertisements. Um, but really within medicine, it's kind of uh, an emerging field. Like how do you tailor a perfect surgery to a perfect person, at least give them um, their particular risk profile, their chance of success with all the data points that you can enter. And, um, you know, it's a really interesting talk in, in, in the area, which I have a clinical interest, which is spinal deformity, because really sometimes that information could be, um, you know, it could tell you if you should do a surgery or not. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, this is a bit of a misleading title, The Future of Spine Surgery. 
robotics and navigation. Um, I don't have any relevant disclosures uh, uh, pertinent to this talk. Um, and the reason why it's a little um, misleading is really the future is now. If you guys uh, have not seen this, this is a uh, spot. This is the Boston Dynamics robot dog. It's now available commercially for $75,000 a pop. Um, and if you want to um, have some bad dreams tonight, uh, go and, and Google a video of this dog walking around and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. But uh, within spine surgery, when we talk about navigation robotics, I mean, this is the state of the art, uh, but this has uh, also um, been done for a while. I mean, this, uh, these technologies have been utilized uh, certainly in our centers uh, for at least, uh, you know, a decade or so. And uh, what we do want to say is that um, uh, to give you an explanation, as Zori mentioned, spinal fusions are increasing um, the, as the population is aging to treat spinal pathology. We're doing more fusions. Frankly, the cost of technology is also increasing. And hopefully um, that translates to improved outcomes, uh, less pain, quicker recovery for patients. I just want to give you an idea of what um, I'm referring to with navigation robotics, because right now um, in its current state, really navigation is uh, and, and robotics are used to place instrument uh, instrumentation accurately, that being pedicle screw instrumentations. Um, now, the, the, uh, the classic way is, you know, you make an incision, you open up uh, the spinal landmarks and based on the surface landmarks of the bone or with some x-ray or a fluoroscopic guidance, you, uh, you cannulate the pedicle um, and place instrumentation, which then you can use to stabilize and allow the spine to fuse. Well, um, navigation involves in its various forms some uh, amount of cross-sectional imaging, in this case, uh, utilizing an O-arm, which is an intraoperative CT scanner. Um, the patient um, is uh, placed on the table this metal frame is an image tracker, which then uh, gives a reference point for the CT scans and the images, and then um, guides or instruments. So as we're placing the screws, as we're um, creating channels within the bone, this then allows us to do this with, with a higher degree of accuracy, as uh, there are some important structures. Um, and so really, I'm going to kind of... Uh, hopefully give a bird's eye view as well of navigation and uh, some of the benefits, really accuracy, uh, radiation, um, uh, prevention, um, the facili uh, facilitation of training, um, use in complex cases, and, and hopefully make a case for, for cost. These are some of the, the commercially available um, um, navigation uh, systems. So, when you talk about placing a pedicle screw in the spine with an open technique, um, the literature is all over the place in terms of how accurate surgeons are. Anywhere from 27.6 to 100%, with the probably most studies settling around the 90% range. So 10% is still a fairly significant number. Um, you can imagine if it's 10% and one of them is this, this is you know a catastrophic injury here. If uh, some of the 10% is this, um, it, it probably is recoverable, but it certainly um, might require revision and or return to the operation, increased cost, increased uh, burden to the patient, increasing their risk of infection. Um, we also place screws percutaneously, and that is with the assistance of, uh, of fluoroscopy through small incisions, and estimates are anywhere between 70 and, uh, and the high 90s for that, with averages around 85%. So uh, I think it's an, obviously a human venture, but can, if, if the aviation in industry had an accuracy rate of 90% and 10% uh, of the flights didn't quite make it to exactly how you wanted, obviously nobody would fly. So the purpose of this is really uh, providing a higher level of accuracy. This was a review looking at um, 23 studies, almost 6,000 pedicle screws, and essentially uh, as you look at the, the com congregative data, I think that navigation is becoming the new gold standard of placement of instrumentation as there's significantly higher accuracy as well as a trend, although it's not a statistically significant difference in the rates of neurologic injury. Um, a more recent meta-analysis also favored navigation 
Um, the only three major neurologic complications were freehand uh, screws. And then even more uh, recent meta-analysis, uh, 2015, um, showed that uh, CT navigation was substantially favorable to even a fluoro, uh, fluoroscopic guided technique and it really decreased the odds of having a breach, which is where the pedicle screw goes outside of the bone, somewhere where it's not supposed to be. Um, but, but just not having a breach, I think, is not purely accurate. Uh, I think um, we pride ourselves on our carpentry, and uh, really when you take a look at um, optimizing the placement of these screws, getting greater biomechanical strength, um, allowing someone uh, to have a, a quicker fusion or have a higher likelihood of having a fusion. Um, and navigation allows us to optimize and really uh, plan our screws so that uh, we can do that. Um, additionally, when you place a screw at the top uh, of the level that you're fusing, the facet joint is nearby of the level above, the one that you're not fusing. And this uh, is a CT scan illustrating how Although both of these pedicle screws are within the pedicle and are not causing a neurologic injury, um, this probably happens more often than we would think where there actually is a screw going into that joint and probably hastening um, the rate of degeneration of that next level. Um, so uh, even beyond preventing a neurologic problem or a vascular problem, can we also decrease the risk of an adjacent level problem? Um, switching gears, um, as we know, uh, radiation is, is cumulative, uh, has effects uh, in potential tumorogenesis, uh, glaucoma, and really as surgeons, we are at risk. This is a study by Harry Schuffelbarger, who's a, a pretty well-known pediatric surgeon. And, and really, um, it's quite sobering at the levels estimated if a surgeon starts his career at age 30, within a decade, um, they would exceed the lifetime limit for uh, non-classified workers. Um, and that is with, uh, with protection, frankly, uh, using all the leaded gear and everything like that. Uh, we oftentimes don't protect our eyes. So this is something uh, where uh, by using navigation, we can limit fluoroscopic exposure to not only us, but also the anesthetic team, um, the nurses, the scrub techs, everybody involved within the case. Um, I think uh, more importantly, uh, particularly in a, a training institute, um, you know, this really allows us to facilitate training. Um, as I am doing my work, um, a trainee is involved and they're able um, to proceed with some amount of confidence and oversight as if they're using navigation, I'm able to monitor that simultaneously. I know what they're doing is safe. If I'm not sure about what they're doing, I say, hey, you need to check that. Um, we also do it another way for, for lower level trainees who I don't feel comfortable letting them do as much. I just have them pick a start point with a probe and we look at it with navigation and, and they get that instant feedback of why uh, it's not exactly right or that would be a good spot or a good position. So it really has tremendous benefit from that standpoint um, and allows uh, you know, trainees to be involved and participate in fairly complex uh, deformities such as this one. Uh, switching gears into complex cases, um, some unique applications of uh, navigation, um, resection of uh, uh, multi-level vertebrectomies, um, and this was uh, even really interesting, um, musculoskeletal tumors, ensuring that full bony margins are achieved, um, so using navigation in that way. And I, I really do think that um, this is the present, this is not the future. Um, but the application of it um, is certainly ever evolving as well as um, um, our, our, our workflows. Let's switch gears uh, to robotics. As this probably um, is in the trending phase of things, I don't think that it's uh, caught on quite uh, um, uh, nationally and globally like something like the Da Vinci robot. Um, you know, the Da Vinci robot, as you know, for used for prostate surgery is really a short distance telerobot. Um, so uh, theoretically, if you had a stable uh, connection, you could actually not be physically present. Um, I believe uh, the first uh, true telesurgery was a laparoscopic cholecystectomy called the Lindbergh experiment in 2001. Um, it was done in France and the surgeon was in New York. So I don't think that... Uh, 
uh, many surgeons are applying uh, quite that level of, uh, of um, technology yet. Um, but this, you know, has the potential to be the future in terms of expanding the reach of care um, and also, of course, from a safety standpoint. So the telerobot um, uh, is not quite there for spine surgery yet. And my guess is within the next uh, five to 10 years, you'll see more emerging applications for this. Really, um, what robotics and spine surgery is now is an extension of image guidance and facilitation of placement of instrumentation. Um, there are three FDA-approved systems on the market, um, and uh, they all have uh, you know, their various um, uh, differences. But in essence, there is, uh, again, a navigation uh, type system, which is then linked to a robot arm, uh, which can then independently be controlled um, to then um, be able to guide the track of the surgeon's hand as they're placing the instrumentation. Um, and really, I think the literature um, suggests that this is still uh, a technology in uh, process improvement. Uh, a narrative review showed uh, somewhere between 85 and 100 percent accuracy rate across 29 studies. Um, there were issues in some studies where um, the instrumentation needed to be improved, uh, certain techniques needed to be improved, and of course a learning curve with inaccuracy between uh, 10 to 20 uh, uh, inaccuracy between the first 10 and 20 cases uh, being done. Um, but a, a more recent meta-analysis. Um, really compared freehand robotic assisted uh, versus robotic assisted uh, um, uh, placed screws. And really um, you had a greater chance of having what would be, we call a perfect placement screw um, as well as a clinically acceptable screw using uh, robotics. So that's uh, fairly convincing data. Uh, I'm going to pass by this. Um, as we apply these new technologies, the question is, is this actually going to benefit a patient in terms of their complications and in terms of the cost? Uh, this was uh, a pretty interesting study done um, where they looked at robotic assisted pedicle screw placement and looked at um, within the nationwide inpatient sample at 257 patients and then matched them with controls. Um, uh, of note, they were not able to match them for the operating time and level of fusions, which uh, was a problem of the study. But ultimately, they found that there wasn't a major difference in complicate or significant difference in complications after a covariate analysis and a no, no difference in length of stay between the two, although there was some increased cost. Now, I think this is a good first step, but I think the data is incomplete with the study. I think that um, the conclusions are not that robots don't help or aren't, don't have the um, potential to save um, uh, money or cost or patient morbidity. Um, I think that we really just need more data. Um, this was another study looking, uh, uh, it was a modeling done by uh, Richard Menger, looking at integrating robotic spine technology within their center. Uh, they reviewed all the cases uh, in the past year and identified essentially around 10%, which could have been converted to an MIS fusion. Um, they modeled some differences in uh, decreased infection rates, revision rates, as well as length of stay and operative time. And they overall estimated if they had made an annual change, they would have uh, immediately of those only 10% of their cases um, it would have resulted in the annual cost savings of, uh, of about $600,000. Um, so again, uh, fairly rudimentary study in terms of, uh, you know, this could change depending on how you model the infection rates or the revision rates and very theoret theoretical information. But I think, uh, you know, certainly within the next three to five years, you're going to see uh, some of the data come out as the institutions have, have adopted this. What I think the real benefits of uh, robotics are is that it's it probably, uh, it's certainly better accuracy than freehand, at least similar to better accuracy, but the reduced cognitive load and surgeon fatigue to get there. So for example, when we're doing a fusion, the screws are an integral, integral part of the procedure, but if it's a very complex case and a big deformity, you know, a surgeon may actually be fatigued, um, both mentally and physically, by just getting those steps done. And if there's a level of assistance and comfort and uh, being able to obtain the same accuracy, 
then that attention, that cognitive load could be directed to more critical portions of the case, um, that being the decompression or the reduction or um, you know, correcting the deformity. I think additionally, uh, with a robotic system, and I'm gonna go through some cases and you'll see kind of how it, how it works in, in real life, there's a forced preoperative planning um, and, and that really makes this optimally placed instruments so that when we're putting in rods and straightening out the spine, there's not as much strain on where the screws insert into the bone. So this first case um, is a, a, a deformity patient, a 69 year old female. Um, these are not my cases. I do have to give a shout out to one of our former fellows, Martin Pham, who's a neurosurgeon, um, uh, did our fellowship a, a few years back, is now practicing at uh, UCSD. Um, and uh, this was a case of a T9 to ilium posterior spinal fusion, so a big uh, deformity uh, reconstruction. Uh, and just to give the workflow, a patient goes through and has a preoperative CT scan. And this loads the images of the x-rays and the 3D reconstruction into some imaging uh, um, software, which allows uh, the surgeon to plan out uh, really down to... Um, kind of a mathematic uh, certainty what they're going to do, or at least what they're gonna hope to do during the surgery. You can see that uh, at each level, they've scrolled through the CT scans and placed the optimal trajectories for the screws. Um, and then they can put in um, exactly how uh, the correction is gonna um, uh, uh, manifest as well as how the rods are going to line up the, the length of the rod kind of a lot of things that we, we figure out within surgery, otherwise kind of on the flyer as we're doing it. So again, preparation I think is the major, um, major benefit here. I'm gonna just skip through that. Um, and so uh, again, uh, preoperative uh, imaging uh, allows us to plan uh, down to our, uh, the angles and correction that we want um, and then execute. And really, uh, you can see just kind of how the rods line up and how they were planned facilitates how the spine is actually straightened, derotated, and, and the scoliosis is corrected. Even more uh, exciting is uh, oh, uh, to, to take a step back and, and to just see what that looks like in action. This is the Mazor. Uh, it's a Medtronic robot. Um, used to be the spine assist. Um, these pins right here insert into the iliac crest, and then it's, the robot arm is then mounted. This secondary arm also uh, mounts onto the spinous process, so it's very rigid. There's a third, uh, there's an, another arm, which is kind of the image guidance and, uh, and uh, does the markings in regards to the spine. And after uh, the spine is kind of re-registrated uh, to the preoperative CT scan, then the, the robot arm moves into the correct position uh, to the trajectories that were planned. Um, so this is where some of uh, the really exciting work is being done. Um, can you plan things so that you're actually decreasing the burden of fairly complex surgeries? In this case, another uh, you know, T9 to the ilium or pelvis uh, posterior spinal fusion, which is a big surgery. You know, that's a, a five to seven day stay in the hospital, usually uh, you know, re replacing somewhere between one and three units of blood or one to three liters of blood. And in this case, this patient was able to be treated with kind of a, a quote unquote application of some minimal invasive techniques um, and, and have really low blood loss, no transfusions, and uh, not have to go to ICU and, and be able to be discharged home. Um, so you can see a fairly significant degenerative scoliosis here, a previous fusion within the low portion of the spine and this patient is having trouble standing upright because uh, their spine is kind of tilting so far forward. You can see he's really kind of throwing his hips back to try to stay upright. And uh, so again, um, preoperative planning being key. Uh, in this case, this looks just like kind of a forest and a, and a mess, but really this is careful planning on how to integrate uh, the correction needed and how to minimize the incisions and minimize kind of the bony work that needs to be done. So in this case, um, they planned uh, a multiple levels of releases within the front of the spine to allow it to come back. Um, the spine was opened kind of in the mid portion 
uh, with a full dissection to be able to make some bony cuts in the back or osteotomies to close down the spine. But in the rest of the spine, the instrumentation was actually placed, uh, although a midline incision was made, it was these screws are placed through the muscle without dissecting it all the way off the midline and off the bone. And what that results in is essentially not having to strip the muscle within the mid portion of the spine here. And really, uh, this is what uh, we refer to as a, a forest of towers. Um, it's really trying to manage um, and keep track of all the different uh, uh, instrumentation that we're putting in. And this is uh, what x-rays look like, an absolute mess. But then you can see the only portion of the spine, which actually the bone has to be dissected, and uh, which is typically kind of the more devitalizing and more painful portions, is kind of the areas where the bony cuts are made and the instrumentation again is done separately. Uh, the min, min, uh, again, many open posterior column osteotomies at these levels. And then the correction is done uh, with rods passed um, through uh, the pre-planned screws so that everything is in alignment and allows these, uh, uh, the correction to be done quite nicely for this patient. So a, a fairly extreme example of uh, of uh, the use of this technology. I think that's also the present, but um, a lot of work being done. Really, when we talk about the future in robotics, I think uh, instead of going from really uh, a, a set navigated controlled arm, uh, we want to move uh, and to push this technology to, uh, technology to advance shared control systems. Um, for example, if we're doing a decompression or we're making cuts in the bone, um, you know, having a robot arm or uh, uh, the instrument being guided by something which won't go into a place which is dangerous, right? It just simply won't allow you to do that. And that's actually being done in a total knee in the, in a, um, in the Mako robot. Um, there's a drill that's used to do some of the bony cuts and it won't let you go past so that on accident you might take too much bone. Um, also, I think uh, some of the things like bending the rods to be able to do the correction based on the placement of the screw. Um, and really, I think in terms of uh, uh, larger healthcare implications where there may not be specialists available, really uh, advancing a telesurgical system uh, which, uh, with increased precision and accuracy, uh, similar to the Da Vinci, but again, uh, potentially being applied to remote areas. Um, in conclusion, uh, robotic technology really does have an advancing role in spinal uh, pathology and deformity. Additional work is going to be needed uh, in terms of developing technique and workflow. And we need more studies to show that this is all correlating with increased safety and uh, patient to outcomes. Thank you very much. Uh, and of course, we'll take any questions. Any questions? You can use the chat box if you want. Oh, I see Dr. McHale. Let me. Dr. McHale, are you there? Question from Heidi, do we ever let physical therapists sit in on surgeries for learning purposes? Uh, Pre-COVID, I would say uh, yes, uh, just having to go through, uh, you know, the normal health clearances and everything. Currently, we're kind of restricting, um, you know, overall access to the operating room. Even, you know, medical students, we're not having like, you know, multiple medical students in one case, just to be able to, to distance as much as possible. Um, you know, when, when all this is done, circle back because I'm sure uh, we'd be able to, to set something up. Okay.
Well, if there's no other questions, I'd like to thank everybody for spending, oh, for spending uh, uh, this time with us. Oh, actually, I think uh, Dr. McHale has a question. Um, if I'm understanding correctly, the most common reason for the need of the second surgery in the lumbar spine. Um, so the, if you're referring to the second case, um, that was a case of spinal deformity, uh, multifactorial. The patient had a prior fusion in the low portion of the spine, but you can see that they developed a degenerative curvature uh, on top of that, which probably they had to uh, some extent uh, before even the fusion. Um, the main reason for that surgery is an issue with um, sagittal imbalance, that being their spine has settled uh, in such a way that they no longer can maintain a center of gravity with their head over their pelvis. And uh, given that leads to you know, really significant uh, dysfunction um, and, and very poor quality of life, uh, oftentimes a large deformity correction will be undertaken. Um, that gets back to a little bit of predictive analytics, uh, just like uh, Zori was talking about. Um, it's uh, sometimes a very large surgery, sometimes too much that a patient will be able to undergo. Um, and, uh, but sometimes, um, you know, if, uh, if the patient's situation and their symptoms are correct and their health status is correct and um, something that can substantially benefit them. So I just wanted, again, to thank everybody for spending the evening with us. Again, if you uh, would make sure to fill out your evaluation and um, you will get your CME um, uh, from, from Betsy or from Melody. Um, and thank you for everyone uh, for joining us. Oh, I think we have one more question too. Um, the question was, does fusion help with uh, radicular sciatic pain and how many percent is successful? Um, I think uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, fusion is not specifically designed to treat sciatic pain. It is oftentimes a byproduct of what we need to do to treat the sciatic pain. So not every sciatica problem requires a fusion. If it's something where the spine is stable or we are able to get the pressure taking, taken off the nerve without destabilizing the spine. And oftentimes we don't do fusion. So it's not just, you know, sciatica equals fusion. Um, but that being said, when the spine is unstable or, or, or the reason for a nerve being pinched is because the relationship, the relationship of the bones is are affected, then fusion is undertaken. I think the percentage of success really depends on the indication for surgery in general. Uh, for leg pain, uh, for sciatica pain with nerve compression, which requires a fusion for other reasons, uh, the results are in the uh, above 90% range in terms of reaching uh, a clinically significant uh, difference. Zori, any last words? No, I think we covered everything. Thank you all. Thanks, and please uh, join in. There, there will be uh, many more sessions upcoming. Uh, we appreciate your time, and thanks to Betsy and Melody for putting this together. Absolutely. Thank you all. Take care. Be safe.